Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. We'll get started in a minute. Don't know if we'd like to start early. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> All right, we've got um, a pretty packed session with four speakers, so I think we'll just get started. Thank you so much for joining us early today. Um, we're talking about open access usage data. We'll look at both journals and ebooks. So, the format of the session we've got four speakers here Tasha Mens Cohen from Counter, we've got Christina Drummond from the OA Books Usage Data Project, <laughs> um, Andrea Lopez from Annual Reviews, and Matthew Goddard from Iowa State University. They will each speak for five minutes. We've got short presentations, um, and then we've got some pre prepared questions that we'll discuss a little bit. And there should be time for Q&A at the end. If you've got any questions, please use the microphone so people that will watch the recording will be able to hear it as well. Um, so I am supposed to show this one, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name's Romy Beard. I'm Head of Publisher Relations at Cronosop, and I'm just facilitating and moderating the session today. So I'll pass on straight away to Tasha. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, and good morning, everyone. So, yes, I'm Tasha Mellins Cohen. Uh, I'm labelled as project director for Counter, but I've recently been relabeled She Who Counts. Um, I do not have slides for you, so I just have three to four minutes of speaking, and then I'm going to hand over to Christina. You're all here, so I very much hope that you know that Counter is the industry standard for usage metrics. We've been around for the best part of 20 years, and we came out of a collaboration between publishers and librarians who wanted a consistent and comparable way to measure usage that would allow librarians to calculate cost per download, which is fantastic in a subscription world. We aren't really in a subscription world anymore. So one of the questions that I am fairly regularly asked is whether there is still a point to counter for open access. Uh, and the short answer is yes, there definitely is. Um, since 2019, when release five of the code of practice became the default, we have included the concept of global reporting or reporting to the world. Now, this is different from a traditional counter report. A traditional report is generated for a specific institution. So, for example, the College of Charleston would receive counter reports reflecting usage by faculty and students affiliated with the college. In a global report, all of that usage will still be included, all of the institutional information is still included, but so is everything else. All of those people who are accessing content outside of university IPs, outside of VPNs, outside of Shibboleth, GetFTR, whatever system you're caring to use. So yes, counter metrics, unique item requests and such like are still relevant in an open access world. I've been asked to touch a little on the difference between journal and book usage. So I'm going to go very quickly. Journals are measured at the level of the article, so that is the item. And we would always say to use the unique item requests for your institution if you're calculating cost per use. I'm very tired of answering that question. Uh, journal metrics, journal usage tends to accrue very quickly after publication. Books, by contrast, are counted at the level of the title, the book itself, not the chapter. That is changing in the upcoming release 5.1. We had a big consultation about that over the summer. There's loads of information online about what is coming. As well as being counted slightly differently at the moment, book usage also tends to accrue more slowly than journal usage. So that's your very brief difference. Going back into the question of open access, we also have problems around distributed usage. So for an ebook, you might have your open access ebook in 10, 15, dozens of different repositories. And you have, as a publisher or as an author or as a funder, no idea 
what that distributed usage looks like unless you can get reports from every single system. And this is where we come to a challenge with counter because we have to acknowledge that it is not the easiest thing to do to develop counter reports. There are fantastic services out there who will do it for you, but even they have had to put quite a lot of work into getting it right. So there is a question in my mind as to how we encourage open access repositories and other places to deliver usage reports that librarians can use that are consistent and comparable regardless of whether they're using counter as the standard or not. And I would argue that we have a fallback position. I'm sure you're all familiar with the tabular counter reports, but we also require publishers and report providers to deliver reports in our JSON format. And that schema, the way that we have defined our JSON is sufficiently flexible that it can be adapted to deliver any kind of usage metrics, regardless of whether or not the platform has chosen to become counter compliant. And if that platform can use our JSON schema, they can also then use the Sushi protocol. Uh, I now need somebody to put a tick in my calendar and I can have Sushi for dinner. Um, the Sushi protocol is the standardized usage statistics harvesting initiative, and it is a standardized mechanism for collecting usage reports. Now we have the JSON format and the Sushi protocol, which would mean that anyone, regardless of whether they are counter compliant or not, can deliver usage metrics from one place to another, which really does lead me on to the OAE Open Access eBook Usage Data Trust. Did I get it right? Yes. So I'm going to hand over to Christina, who can tell you about data exchange, whether or not the user is counter compliant. That's why we call it OAEBU for short. It's really a mouthful. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I know it is early, and I wanted to do a little bit of a wake up participation here first as we get started. And I'm curious, for those of you in the room, how many folks have within their institution, you're working with um, either building a data warehouse, a data lake, something to bring together your OA usage statistics. Let's see, does anyone know here, show of hands, is anyone building those today in their institution? How many people are looking at the, you know, between Plan S, OSTV memo coming out, realizing, wow, we really should be thinking about hiring people to help with this? Anyone? Or have you hired? I'll say both. And how many people are like, I don't know what she's talking about, it's early, there was a reception yesterday, I'm waking up. Okay, interesting. Well, I think that's a really good place to start. Uh, so I'm Christina Drummond, I'm the Executive Director for the OAEBU Project, or the Open Access Book Usage Data Trust. And our effort has been focusing on how, as an ecosystem, we can enable community-governed sharing of quality and interoperable OA usage data from across platforms. Our global work has been ongoing since 2015 and has been made possible from the support uh, from the Mellon Foundation. And we're entering our third phase where we're now focusing on the shared rules and frameworks that can guide systems integration and interoperability at scale um, to relieve the burden of this usage reporting on individual institutions. The problem around OA usage data sharing is not a technical one. As we've heard here in Charleston, there are many commercial nonprofit organizations and efforts that are innovating usage data aggregation and reporting services at scale. But trust and security, data ownership and licensing issues around that usage data complicate the exchange and reuse of the usage data. Organizations that provide access to their usage data want to trust that it will be handled with care and that such access will not be detrimental down the road. Yet they also see value in improving the quality and efficiency of OA book usage data aggregation for reporting and enabling OA usage benchmarking. This is where I'll note that only with quality benchmarking can you truly understand the context around your own institution's OA book usage. At the heart of our data sharing community is this concept that we want to get to sharing sovereign usage data directly from the organizations that create it to those who want to use it. The trick is that for many entities, their usage data is sensitive and proprietary, and revealing that data openly can be harmful to their operations. Therefore, for us to facilitate 
OA usage data aggregation and achieve that ability to benchmark across organizations, we have to find a way to securely transit and process the usage data in a trusted, community-governed framework and a neutral third-party organization that equally serves all stakeholders within the OA book usage ecosystem. To get to where we are today, we went through a few years of research. First, we had to understand the challenges that face OA usage data reporting for books. And this included stakeholder workshops, interviews, and focus groups that engaged over 100 individuals from across five continents, mostly actually during the pandemic. And we had to go into detail to understand the ways in which publishers, libraries, and the many platforms and services that serve them look to use and leverage that usage data. We found organizations wanted to do more than just OA usage reporting for their authors and funders. Some dreamed of a future where they could leverage this data in a timely fashion for operational analytics and business intelligence. Libraries wanted to inform collection development and OA effort budgeting. Presses wanted the data for strategy, editorial decision making, sales and marketing decisions for digital and print books, both OA and not. Knowing how usage data is going to be used is only part of the story though. We had to examine the data flows with an eye towards who creates, aggregates, and reports this usage data in the ecosystem. The work shown here, completed by Michael Clark and Lorici for our project, highlights how multiple OA usage reports in various formats, dashboards, I, I was gonna say through seems reports that are just emailed, how these are curated and aggregated by individual publishers, libraries, and library management systems for further distribution downstream. This is where the arrows come together on that chart. In our effort, we think there has to be a better way to do this, and have found that other industries are already solving this problem through structured community-governed data sharing in what's emerging in Europe as the IDS model. And that refers to international data spaces or industrial data spaces. These data spaces operate as a data governance and interoperability layer on top of standards-based data exchange made possible through efforts like Counter and OA Switchboard. I think of it as the connective tissue among organizations. Over the past two years, our stakeholders have been considering how do we apply such framework to scholarly communications, and OA books in particular. We developed a mission and operational principles which focus on a commitment to being open scholarly infrastructure that operates for the global public good. And this has prepared us to focus on the tough conversations this coming year. Following the footsteps of other data spaces in Europe, we're preparing to negotiate big questions in this big tent of publishers, libraries, presses, platforms, and services with different ideologies and different uh, sustainability and business models. And the question here is, can we structure a principle and rule-based interoperability layer to interconnect our existing systems? What technical and security standards are required? What data trans transfer and processing would occur? What are the appropriate and inappropriate uses of OA usage data accessed through this data trust community? And what are the consequences if someone doesn't follow the rules? And then which organizations play what roles to enable this controlled interoperability layer? And how do we sustain that over time? We'll be hosting community consultations and workshops throughout the coming year to develop consensus and chart our path forward on these very important questions. With that, I'm gonna pause. Please email me if you'd like to get engaged. Good morning, everybody. I'm Andrea Lopez from Annual Reviews. I'm the Director of Sales, Partnerships, and Initiatives. And thank you all for being here, and thank you, Romy, for putting this together. I'm going to talk about our experience at Annual Reviews, what we've seen with our open access usage, what we know about that usage, and then I have a lot of questions for all of you about what you want to hear from us about the usage. So we use Subscribe to Open for eight of our titles to open up the usage. And because if we're using library budgets through this program, I think it's really important we talk about what usage you need from us with this program. So the usage, I'm going to talk about two things we've done. We started opening up our usage in February of 2020 was when our first subscribe to open journal, but it also coincided with the pandemic. So at the start of the pandemic, we knew that, yes, in the U.S., a lot of our libraries and subscribers, they had good infrastructure to get access to their people working off-site all of a sudden. But in the rest of the world, in many parts of the world, they did not. So we took our paywall down for about four months to give people time to prepare, and we saw an incredible increase in our usage. 
And in 2021, we had eight of our journals open through the Subscribe to Open program. And I'm comparing it with 2016, which was the last year of our paywall content because we had the public health where we were working on a pilot project with that. And as you can see, we've had an incredible increase in usage. 40% of all of our usage comes from these eight journals, and those are just 16% of our portfolio of journals. And so what do we know about this usage? Well, we have our counter-compliant usage stats, so we can see what the universities are using. And it was, it's a very hard to do some comparisons because, of course, this all started at the start of the pandemic where people went off campus and then back on campus and there were shutdowns. But we didn't, the patterns we saw were no different for our open access journals than for our other journals. We also know a large percentage of the usage is coming from individuals who are not affiliated with an institution. We do have a pop-up survey that comes up if we recognize someone coming in and they're not from a recognized institution. And uh, we had about 91 people fill out that. We took no personal information. I think the number one question that everybody did answer was this for personal or professional use. And about 40% said it was for personal use. But right now there is a very, I think our personal and professional use often crosses over. But we also wanted to know about our non-subscribing institutions. So early on, we worked with PSI to try to match non-subscribing institutions' usage to find out who they were. And now we work with both PSI and LibLinks. And LibLinks will give our counter-compliant usage stats for non-subscribing institutions. And what we found is this very long tail of usage. We had a lot of people when we started this program that were worried about, you know, the free riders. And we're not seeing that. And actually, at the top of our list, we've seen what we, at the top of the list of non-subscribing institutions, we've seen subscribing institutions listed, which means we have to do some work on making sure our IPs are registered properly. But it's this very long tail. And the reason we opened up access was we do a very good job of serving the scientific community, which is part of our mission. What we weren't doing a very good job was filling, fulfilling our mission that was to serve society and benefit society. So we're seeing, and we were hoping we would see policymakers or people who had the opportunity to make some changes in the world start accessing our content. And we've seen that. And I'm not going to go through this list, but we've seen police departments all over the world and we're hopeful that someone is reading an article that can help make a difference in their policing policies. We've seen election offices. We've seen all types of institutions that would never have a budget or never be somebody that would subscribe to our journals. And they're not taking huge amounts of content. It's usually one or two articles here and there. So we believe that by opening up access, we are fulfilling that second part of our mission. And we originally planned to we were going to turn 100, and there's some dispute about if it's 2031 or 2032, but our plan was to add a few journals each year until we got to our 100-year anniversary and be a fully open access publisher. But we saw, when we saw who was using our content, we decided that we needed to do that sooner rather than later. We didn't want to wait 10 years for these people to have access to our content. So based on that, we decided to move forward with all 51 of our journals for 2023. And I really like to end by asking, I have a, we have a lot of questions from the library market, is what do you need from us? We don't know what percentage of your usage comes via VPN or proxy server. And will we use that usage, will we lose that usage when we go fully open? Or our researchers, do they normally just log into the VPN? And if we do start to see that, will you take that into account? Would it be helpful for you to see global usage statistics, regional usage statistics? a list of the local institutions using the content that you've subscribed to. And also, would it be helpful for you to have usage of your institutional author's articles? So I'll end that there, and I'm hoping Matthew may answer some of those questions. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Thank you for being here, and um, it is an honor to be uh, on a panel with such accomplished speakers doing such important work in this area. Um, so just to set the context for my remarks, uh, I have here a few numbers that provide a bit of background on what Iowa State has been doing over the last few years around open access. And now looking at these numbers, uh, you might assume that we at Iowa State have this open access thing um, 
pretty much figured out and I'm, I'm up here to explain to you our bulletproof strategy for open access usage stats to promote our open initiatives and inform our collections budgeting decisions. Well, that is a talk that I would love to hear as well. Um, so I'm sorry to say that that is not our position. I think instead we are in a similar position as most other US libraries. We are aware of open access usage data. We have some, but not exactly what we want. And we don't quite know exactly what we want. And we haven't figured out exactly how we'd use what we want if we did get it. So in other words, we've gotten about as far as saying uh, yes, please, but not much farther than that in terms of deciding which data points are most salient, what weight they should receive relative to other factors, or how to integrate them into our existing processes. So instead of sharing our non-existent open access usage data plan, I'd like instead to uh, just share three thoughts or ideas listed here that I hope will spur further thought and discussion, and I think perhaps indirectly answer some of the questions that Andrea brought up. Um, so it seems to me that uh, the possible use cases for OA usage data in libraries fall into two broad categories. On the one hand, advocacy, and on the other hand, uh, decision making. And the first idea on this slide uh, falls into the advocacy category. So I, I take it for granted that authors generally have a keen interest in their readers in getting a sense of how much use their work is getting and where those readers are located around the world. And of course I know from experience that libraries have a keen interest in strengthening their relationships with researchers and demonstrating the value of open access. So by aggregating usage data from across open publishers, what if libraries had the ability to share out periodic readership updates with their institutional authors? This would provide not only a valuable service, but would also allow authors to see the stark difference in use between their open and gated research, thereby further solidifying institutional support for the library's open initiatives. Now this is, I know, not a, a novel or revolutionary idea. In fact, I expect that many publishers are already doing this, but I think it will be very interesting to see whether libraries are able to take on this role increasingly in the future. Now the second idea brings us uh, back into the world of budgeting, of collections, of deciding how our uh, funds get spent. And it's a little uh, tricky to explain this, but the basic idea is that the institution should be the anchor of the usage data that gets applied to those questions. And, and how it is the anchor will depend on the open access funding model. So thinking about those models, you can broadly divide them into two categories. Those that are based on institutional, the institutional affiliation of the researchers and those that are not. So in the first category, of course, would be read and publish agreements as well as agreements with pure OA publishers like PLOS. And in this category, where we are paying, our institutional, paying to open up our institutional research, we're paying to open that up to the world. So it makes sense to consider the global usage of that specific content. Now on the other hand, you have OA models like Diamond and Subscribe to Open, which are not based on institutional research, although that may be an important consideration. And in those contexts, I think it makes more sense to continue to consider your institutional usage and to use that as the, the anchor that ties our decisions back to our local context. So the third idea, I really don't have time to do justice to this one, but it, it follows on from the second. So if different geographical scopes of usage might be applied in different contexts, perhaps it makes sense to consider a composite usage score that does not treat all usage equally. So usage from a campus IP address could count as perhaps one full use. Usage from, in our case, the state of Iowa could be weighted as perhaps seven or eight tenths of a use with national or, or international uses receiving proportionally lower weighting. And weighting uses in this way and combining them into a composite score would allow us to include global uses in our decision making because those are, of course, indeed important for open access uh, funding while still at the same time giving due consideration to, the, to our own local readers. So those are just some ideas. Take them 
for whatever they seem to be worth to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much. And thanks, everyone, for sticking to your times. Um, I'll get started with a question about institutional usage. Matthew, you've talked about there is a use case for that. There's also a use case for global usage. One of the main problems with institutional usage for open access content is obviously linking it to institutions. And I know Andrea talked about working with the IP registry to link to institutions. Now, one thing I've heard and haven't talked to lots of different people is very different statistics on how, what percentage of usage can you link back to an institution. And I've heard something from 30% to like 85%. Any, any thoughts on where we are and what is the realistic um, number and how that can be overcome? Obviously, there's auditing of IP addresses you can do as well to strip away, you know, unreal usage or robot usage, um, but can we ever get to real data for that? I, I think we can never have the same level of certainty as we had in the licensed e-resources world that we are covering everything. Um, I think some of the work that you just described is probably important to do at an institutional level to get a sense of, because each institution is going to have its own sort of geographic distribution. You know, we at Iowa State are pretty concentrated in, um, I, I I think the, you know, in the city of Ames and it's central central Iowa, but you know, depending on where you are and the nature of your institution, um, that could be look very different. Um, so if you can can do some, I don't know, it'd be interesting to to develop some sort of toolkit that would allow each library to sort of develop that profile, and then once you had that sense, uh, you could sort of apply that to, uh, to the open access usage you're seeing. So basically, say. You know, here's what we are able to identify as institutional mm -hmm. usage. We know that it's most likely, you know, twice that or 50% more than that. Tasha, do you want to say anything about that? Sure. Thank you. So we have the concept in the existing uh, counter release five of geographic extensions to the code of practice. So we can already subdivide global usage by country and by country subdivision, so state, for example. Um, we have some reservations about trying to be more granular than that beyond a, a specific institution's uh, directly attributable uh, mechanisms, so IP, VPN, and, and such like, partly because it is quite common for IPs to be reallocated. So if you were to try to say, you know, these are the IP ranges for our local city, that might only apply for three to six weeks before it becomes defunct, whereas uh, state level or, or, or country level IPs are less commonly redistributed. Uh, I really liked your idea about um, weighting usage but I would hope that that would be happening library side rather than asking publishers to do those calculations for every single institution. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm going to skip some of the questions in the interest of time, but I want to jump to the question about location of items and different versions that are there. Christina, you talked a lot about that already, about the different versions that are there for e-books e and distributed usage. And for journals, I feel like no one is really looking at that yet. All we're doing is looking at the PDF as it is on the publisher's site um, and not so much different versions, in the same version that's in an institutional repository, a preprint version, other versions that are floating about there. How important is it that we go there and who should be responsible? I'm just going to make a, a comment that the more we want to depend on this data for operational decision making, the more we need it to be quality and holistic. And so if we don't include these other aspects, you're only seeing a part of the picture, a part of the story of readership. Um, and I think then that really makes it challenging for our decision making. I think from the journal side, particularly when it's a CCBY license, it can end up in so many places. There are some organized places where it can show up. Um, we were talking with ResearchGate yesterday, and you know, some publishers, if you have a syndication, you can get your usage and feed that back to the library if you're working with them. Um, I asked Philip, I said, can libraries go and get 
their usage from ResearchGate. Um, and that's something that you probably would want to talk with Philip about, but um, it would have to be the more organized. I don't think there's any way we could find it in the thousands of places it could show up. I, I would add, this isn't a new problem. I've been having conversations with journal indexing and abstracting services for at least the last 15 years while I was still publisher side asking to understand the usage of the content that I had been providing for free to abstracting and indexing services. And it's quite difficult to get that information out sometimes. So from a, a, an internal publisher perspective, understanding usage even of subscription content that is in the wild is still really valuable and a distinctly missing piece of the puzzle. So yes, I do think it's something we need to look at. It's, it's on the list. And for things like ResearchGate, if you're given usage, you then amalgamate it and share it with any institutions that you would share it with, wouldn't you, Andrea? Or as a publisher, you would? If, yeah. I think that was how it was presented to us, but you have to be in their syndication program, and not mm -hmm. all publishers are. But you can, you could, you'd have to work with your platform provider to find yeah. a way to feed that back out. So some of the role could be on, should be on the publisher, right? If the they know where some versions end up, that yes. is the controlled ones. Um, one last question for me before I open it up to the floor: um, Should open access usage data be openly available? So every time I hear this question, I always like to remind folks, when we were talking about usage data, what are we talking about? We're talking about IP addresses. And you know, if that is not treated in, in Europe, that actually counts as personally identifiable information. Can we put that all out there in the open for people to do whatever they want with? Um, should there be ethical guidelines to rein in that use? I would argue, you know, especially in what we've heard from a lot of entities, especially our corporate uh, partners and stakeholders, is that that's sensitive proprietary information. Um, and, you know, publishers, presses, platforms that talks about the volume of usage of your service. What does that mean for your operations if that were openly available to your competitors? And so I think there are a lot of dynamics here that make usage data something that needs to be as open as possible but as controlled as necessary to make sure we can get to that greater good and understand the aggregate and understand benchmarking. Yeah, obviously there's you know privacy considerations with sharing who is accessed what. Um, I'm thinking of more um, general, like this is how much usage there's been for this article, something that an author can share in terms of global usage and not split necessarily by you know institution. I'll just add to that that I you know here in the U.S. Um, there's some national security conversations right now around making sure not only do all scholars have a unique identifier, uh, unnamed, uh, it, which we all know what that is, but um, that it is tied to their research. So I would like to always point out what are the unintended consequences of us putting that data out there for authors, for anyone to pick up and reuse? How could that be used for disinformation or misinformation campaigns? How could that be used in a negative way? Um, and if we start imagining those negative consequences, I think that brings it back to, well, should it be open? Good points. So playing devil's advocate, I'm not talking about the person, the identifiable information, but certainly aggregate usage, in my view, is one of the measures of impact that should sit alongside citations and altmetric. And if we're fine with making those publicly available, I have to question whether usage should also be openly available at the aggregate level. But then you do have the difficulties of saying, well, you know, this publisher can confirm they've had X thousand aggregate usage on this platform, but if it's in 17 other different repositories, should that usage metric reflect total usage aggregated across platforms? And that's a whole separate problem. I guess if it's a standard, if everyone wants to do it, then it, the, you know, the pressure is on the publishers to try and get all that usage from different platforms. Thank you so much, everyone. Right, do we have any questions in the room? Can you please walk up to one of the microphones so we can hear you and it's being recorded? Hello.
Hello. I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you much, so much for all the interesting thoughts and discussion. Um, my name is Athena Hepner. I'm at the University of Central Florida. And I would love to have a lot more open access usage data. With your list of questions, do you want X, Y, Z? The answer is yes to all of them. Um, but I wonder what is in it for a lot of the, op the fully open sites? Because it is non-trivial to try and come up to distribute even non-counter standards. If you're just, you have an open site, you don't have to have that infrastructure right now. What is the, the hurdles that that sort of open site faces and how do we help them overcome them? So, the, not having to get down to institutional level usage is a really helpful first start. As I've said, there are services who specialize in creating counter reports for publishers who cannot or prefer not to do it themselves. Um, when, and, and recently open platforms have been coming to me and asking for assistance in, in becoming counter compliant. And I do always suggest if you're not sure that you want to build it, you might want to speak to these, these services. The long term dream, I, I would love to work with some funders to develop a widget that can sit on the publisher platforms and do the processing for them, but uh, that that's going to have to wait until after release 5.1 is live and then I'm going to create some grant business case and hopefully everybody in this room will back me and say yes we want you guys to fund this, uh, but that's, that's slightly wish fulfillment at this point in time. I think part of the um, part of your question is also thinking about uh, incentives and what incentives do these open publishers have to you know overcome maybe significant obstacles to de delivering counter stats and I I just want to uh, highlight a plus for being a, an open access publisher that does deliver counter stats and um, I think as libraries continue to increasingly engage more with fully open access publishers that in the past have not um, engaged with counter, we can bring that to the table as you know, part of our expectations. I'll just add something else we learned in the last phase of our project, and I know Miles Schneider is here, um, he can speak to this as well, but we have to remember uh, diversity and equity of publishers in this conversation because for scholar-led publishers, our small presses, they don't have the capacity to do this. And for many, Google Analytics or whatever web analytics is as close as they can get. And so the question becomes, you know, are, are, well, how do we as an ecosystem protect against losing all of these parties and just not having all of the impacts they're having represented in our usage statistics? Um, because it is a matter of having the staff and resources to do the standards adoption, which not everyone has. Um, there's a question over here, Tim. Hey, yeah, this is Tim Lloyd from LibLinks. Um, so given, I think everyone in this room would agree that understanding how communities engage with the practice content is important to understanding impact, but a lot of the quantitative methods like trying to match IP addresses, you know, only get a certain proportion of usage and that can vary very widely. Uh, we've got concerns about using personal information and requiring people to log in. Uh, but I've seen other interesting experiments be done within this community in trying to get maybe more uh, qualitative responses from people about the value of open access. So I've seen uh, pop-up surveys, I've seen uh, institutional repositories inviting people to leave comments as to why they found that content useful. So I'm really interested in what the panel's views are on should we be pursuing more of those other methods of trying to demonstrate you know, which communities are getting benefit from it. And I'd be particularly interested in hearing from libraries more generally. You know, what do you think about this? And are you more comfortable with trying to balance this value of open access by getting these communities to express the value they get from it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that question. And I, I, it highlights something that I've been thinking about, that the, the lack of uh, certainty that we discussed earlier, where it's, these are a little bit fuzzier stats when you're looking at open access usage stats, I think that we can see that as, a, as an opportunity to use these numbers in a more intelligent way. I think that in the past, 
with uh, our e-resources stats. Uh, we, we, I think we, we have, in some cases, used those. We've been over-reliant on those, I think, in certain cases. And there's a really, I'm, I'm excited to go to a session this afternoon um, called The Psychology of Metrics that I think is very relevant to that point. Um, and so I think that we can see this as an opportunity to be more thoughtful in, in how we are thinking about usage and not just take one number as the authoritative record of the impact or the, the, the value or the return on investment for these, for these resources. And so the, the, the kinds of additional um, you know, sources of information that you suggested, the more qualitative information, I, I really think that it, 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 it um, is something that the library world should um, really embrace and um, emphasize in the future. And just to respond to that, I think the other thing, and this is hearkening back to my former life as an advocate, um, I think it's really important to ask what you're trying to do with that data. Um, if you're doing advocacy, I really like how you broke it out. You know, if it's advocacy that we're focused on, storytelling has to be more than just a number. That's where that qualitative, those, those stories of impact and how did you actually change policy, change lives, change students, that's a story you need to tell and the number is not gonna tell it for you. But if you want to do operational decision making and decide which, which additions to translate and then put into an agreement, that you need better than just someone's gut subjective opinion. You need hard data. So I think you really have to consider what the use case is that you're trying to apply your usage data to. Thank you so much. And I think that's our time up, unfortunately. Thank you for, to the panel for joining me today. Thank you for coming. Thank you.